Welcome, everyone, to the Madly Chasing Peace radio show with Dina Proctor. I'm a life coach, a speaker, creator of 3 by 3 Meditation, and author of the best-selling book, Madly Chasing Peace, How I Went from Hell to Happy in Nine Minutes a Day. I love helping people transform their lives and find peace and happiness three minutes at a time. My passion for this show is asking my guests, to share their stories of inspiration and success and the importance of mindset and emotion in creating a life of wellness, healing, abundance, and balance. You can learn more about me and my journey on my website, which is madlychasingpeace.com. And so joining me today, I am kind of excited to connect with this little lady. I think that we're a bit of soul sisters of sorts. I read her book and I thought, my gosh, like we have so much in common with just the kind of the way that we write and our perspective of life and even kind of some of the experiences that we have. So I'm excited to have her here. Let me share her bio with you and then we'll bring her on and have her share her story and her wisdom. Um, Her name is Diane. So Diane Bischoff James. MS is a life reboot specialist and a dynamic motivational speaker who encourages audiences to create a reality that is prosperous, deliberate, and meaningful. She's the author of the award-winning book, The Real Brass Ring, Change Your Life Course Now, which is a novel that encourages others to recognize their own personal power and potential. And as well, she's a SAG actor, an empowerment coach, marketing consultant, and founder of LiveYourEverything.com, which is a sanctuary for life-enhancing transformation. Um, And so, Diane, welcome. I am, like, jazzed to connect with you and and share space (laughs) with you right now. (laughs) Well, I'm having, you know, this is a mutual admiration society here because I am totally thrilled to be here and to talk to you. I, I love everything that you're doing. I'm so excited. It's great. It's just um it's just one spins off another. I think that it's really, really fantastic. And your story, you know, what you kind of navigated through your life, I know that um, the when you talk about kind of the real brass ring, like what's important in life, because one of the things I was reading, you know, in your book was like you had the American dream. You had it all. You had everything you wanted, the dream house, the, the kids, the dog, the husband, the everything, you know, in your life seems like it was right. And so could you just take a few minutes and lead us through what that was like, kind of having that American dream, but realizing that something, really the most important thing, was not, in fact, part of your life? Absolutely. Um, Well, it kind of started when I was 38, and I had one of those weird synchronicity experiences where two or three people in a row had said, oh, you've got to go see this woman, and her name is Sonia Choquette. And now she's incredibly well-known. She's internationally known psychic and a healer and a teacher. But back then, and this was you know, over 10 years ago, I, I thought, you know, this would be a, just a really fun birthday present for myself. So I marched myself down to the city. She was actually doing readings in her home. And I really thought that she was going to say, oh, girl, you know, you rock it. You have everything together. Everything's perfect. <laughs> and I thought she would just kind of tell me to just keep going. But instead, I sat in her office for an hour, and she clubbed me over the head and laid out all my dirty little secrets and kind of uh, just took a bat and smashed them across the room. She was one of the very first people ever to call me out on everything because uh, I, had, I had done the programming from, you know, I'm like the tail end of the baby boomers, and we were told, okay, you've got to get this big career, you've got to get a big education, get a big house get cute shoes, you know, drive your red convertible, all that stuff that we were supposed to get. And I was really lucky because I was able to do that. I got the career, I got the, I had my own business, and we got the little mini mansion across from the lake. So when I sat there and she started telling me these things, I literally was like flipping out. I thought I was going to just get sick all over the floor. She was like, <laughs> first of all, she said, your, your marriage is fraternal. She said, it's kind of like a girlfriend relationship. And I had three kids, but I was doing it 16 years, and I just kept going in that direction. But she, she nailed that one. She also said, you're totally in the wrong career. She said, you're supposed to be an author, a teacher, and a healer. And I didn't know what she was talking about. I hadn't written anything except, like, marketing proposals and marketing plans for, you know, 15 years. And then she said, you also can be an actor. She said, you can make a really nice name for yourself in this business. And, and you know, I hadn't been on stage since I was in high school. And, you know, so that was the, uh, you know, the big high school musical career. And then, of course, that went completely flat. And then she said, and I'm going to tell you this, you are chronically and clinically depressed. And I had never told anyone. 
but I was popping those little white pills, which were very popular back then, called Prozac. And that was the only way I could function all day because I was I couldn't get out of bed. I always felt like there was this like huge dark cloud. I don't, anyone who has these kind of experiences, you just feel lethargic and sad, and you don't know why. And and the thing that she she didn't call me out on, but it was clearly true. I mean, I was 190 pounds, so and I know you've had the same type of issues struggling with you know food, and that was my addiction. Food was my addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like Hostess Twinkies. Hostess, you know, the, the snowballs were great. I liked the ding-dongs. I liked anything that, you know, I could pop in my mouth that had to do with either sugar or caffeine or both or had add some flour in there and I would eat it. So that was the only thing that kept me going. And so she said, you know, don't come back to me until you write that book. You know, people are going to love your stories. And then she kind of like was going to leave. She was going to leave her office. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, what happens if I don't do this stuff, and she goes, Diane, I'm telling you, if you don't grab at the real brass ring and hurry up before it's too late, and I'm like, too late for what? She goes, you're going to have to come back and do this all over again. And then she kind of like, kind of like stormed out of the room. And I just sat there and <laughs> oh, my God, how can you be 40, almost 40 years old and have done absolutely everything wrong? You know, I had... The external world was as programmed at doing everything that we're supposed to do. You know, you have the right nail polish color, and you know, you're, you know, you're, you've got the cute bag, the latest Prada bag, and none of that stuff clearly was resonating with the inside. But the funny thing is, like, I never forgot her saying the real brass ring, and I thought, what's the real brass ring, and what if I don't grab it? And and hence that became the name of the book, you know, the real brass ring, because that stuck with me. Every single day since then about, okay, well, I'm going to figure out what that brass ring is, even though I had no clue. I'm going to go grab it. And if, gosh darn it, this lifetime, if I don't get that brass ring, you know, then I, you know, I'm going to make it happen somehow. So I had to basically go through post-traumatic shock. I sat in my car, you know, February, Chicago is my birthday, Mm. sobbing my eyes out because I had to go to a business meeting. But it it was as if someone had just completely undressed me I was sitting there you know naked and raw and sobbing because how do you fix everything how you you know it's not just like oh maybe you should change your house or you know maybe you need to find a a more healthy relationship it wasn't anything like that it was like trash your life start over good luck see you later and so so it was it was pretty it was pretty hard at the time that that was that was 10 it, it took me 10 years 10 years to to fix it all but um in the you know gloriously and beautifully I'm on the other side and and I've had the chance to recraft in all areas so it was a massive life reboot and I'm I'm just I'm very lucky and very blessed even to be here on the other side of it Mm, how amazing and like just reading in the in the book like the journey and the details and the relationship stuff and and everything because it's not like you needed to escape a horribly abusive relationship or a you know there was nothing really terrible about what you were living and you know a lot of it and especially on the outside just looked good and I I just felt like there are so many I'm sure millions of people out there that aren't in bad relationships but like it's just not the amazing one or they're in careers that provide for them well or in houses that are you know pretty good but it's not that fire inside that they're experiencing and so I think that it's really important um, and I know that you obviously struggled with clinical depression and, and your own kind of addiction with food issues and stuff like that. And maybe a lot of people listening in have been down that road or struggle with that too. But I'm really just getting that no matter if things are like good enough, there's that space for it to be just freaking fantastic, you know, for where our lives to go. And, and I love that you're out there kind of sharing this. Um, with the world because no matter if it feels like, because I think so many times we feel like, oh my gosh, I've gone so far with this. I've been doing this for 20 years. How am I going to change course or, you know, feel stuck because of the circumstances or the relationships that we have that we can't make a change. And you are such a testament to be able to break that momentum and beautifully navigate. I mean, not without its ups and downs, but really navigate something fantastic in your own life. So just really great, Diane, really great. Well, thank you. Oh, my God, thank you so much. And if I could touch on just a point of that, I think mm-hmm. what I learned, and this is, this is the challenge, and I, I, when I have the opportunity to work with clients, and, and I've been doing a lot of traveling and going to expos and having the chance to meet people every day who have that same question, well, 
I'm in a relationship or I've been in a marriage for X number of years or this job has been, you know, I'm a lifer, you know, I'm going to stay at this job till the day I retire. And, and the part that I keep noticing that seems so consistent is it's about the level of vibration. And I was vibrating. If there's a line that's like a baseline just of okay, I was below the line mm. on every aspect. Mm. And that, that's something where I like to kind of challenge people. I think being on the line and just saying, yeah, it's pretty good, sometimes the vibration is inside you. In fact, we all know most of it is inside you. And we have the opportunity to raise our own vibration with, you know, everything that we do. But sometimes the vibration is completely below the line. And that's just not a heartfelt connection. And I think that that was the thing that I couldn't manufacture in the relationship, just to touch on that. There was mm. nothing I could do, no matter how much I fixed and doctored up myself. And I, you know, I went to the Hoffman Institute in California, and I went through emotional rehab and tried to come back this spanking new baby spirit. But I couldn't craft something that, like, wasn't there authentically for me. So that's something I had to come to terms with because good people doing good things don't want to hurt each other or hurt kids or hurt families. So that that was one of the hardest things I think I had to grapple with is to say, you know, you're the butler, I'm the maid. And we've been, you know, we've been butler and maid now for 16 years. But I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, and this was the biggest challenge, I didn't want to demonstrate that for my children, that yeah. you don't have a heartfelt connection and that it doesn't resonate on a soul level and you don't also have the fire, you know, the, the juicy fire that comes with a, with a really loving relationship. And so I didn't want them to see any of that. And I think that was the one, that was the turning point for me. So I just wanted to touch on that, that it's not an easy decision. It was something that um, I, I felt like this life authenticity was the most important thing for me, just trying to figure out what that meant and how to find it. And so that's where mm. all that came from, looking at the vibrational level and saying, how much can I fix, how much is inside, and how much is just not partnering up exactly right. So I just wanted to touch on that because I think, I think that's where a lot of people are challenged. Um, it's easy to stay at status quo. It's scary, hard, and beautifully rewarding, though, when you challenge that. Mm. I'm so glad that you said that because I think that it's, huge and really a key that um, so many of us d uh, don't realize or aren't able to, to get to. So I think that that really creates space for people to understand, like, my gosh, she did it. I can do it too. You know, I think that that's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, and talking about vibration, because I love talking about vibration, law of attraction, um, all of that, the power of thought, the power of focus, the role of emotion that comes into it. Because you have many examples, even while you were achieving your American dream, how you manifested your house, how you manifested, um, you know, the amount of money that you wanted to get using that power of focus to create what you wanted to. And of course, in creating the relationships and everything that you have that are the real brass ring for you now, that happiness and that depth and joy and bliss that you have inside of your life now. Um, but I'd love to hear your experience of it and how law of attraction and focus and emotion has all been so powerful for you to be able to create this amazing life today. Again, thank you so much for bringing that up because that was the, the greatest um, tool that I've had since uh, trying to recraft life, a whole life. And what I, mm -hmm. what I came up with and this was just helpful to me because I work with business executives I have for years, for 20 years, and they always ask me one question. They're like, you know, what do I need to know? They don't want to hear the stuff, the outside stuff, you know, forget the details. Just tell me the important stuff. So part of my journey was to craft, I call them 14 shortcuts <clears throat> for happy living. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I put these together, and they're part of the book, and those were the rules of sort that helped me use law of attraction, use all of these different pieces that were coming together, the emotional, the intellectual, the physical, and of course the spiritual aspect of it, and to put them together into these little rules that just reminded me almost every day when I was on track, it seemed like I was following the rule. Oh, wow, this is working. And then when I would get off track, I could go back and kind of look at which of these rules were working and which ones weren't. And let me, let me just give you an example. One of them is about, mm -hmm. and just because we were talking about vibration, one of them is about your wave. Uh, we all look like we're solid and going in straight lines, but the truth is mm -hmm. everything's in motion and we're, we're beings of light. So we're, we're light waves, you know, we're waves that go up and down. So the one thing I noticed is that 
I always had the chance to manage my wave. And that wave could be, and this kind of ties into the whole vibration thing again, there's a high point to the wave and there's a low point to that wave. And it was always fun to learn that there was some thought that always made me feel better. And I could take my wave and raise it up. And it could be something as simple as, okay, if I sit down and just get this proposal over with, which of course is one of my big sticking points. If I have to write stuff sometimes, I'm a huge procrastinator. And so I always <laughs> try to say, okay, if I'm going to get this wave up, you know, because it's not always that fun, uh, what can I do after it? And so I used to, you know, literally I trick myself with reality TV. Oh, I get to go watch The Bachelor, <laughs> you know, because I'm kind of addicted <laughs> to that show. I have no idea. I always say I'm not going to watch it, and I always end up watching the whole series. It's so addictive. But anyway, it's fun for me, and I get my little, you know, time off and a little cave time. So I give myself rewards to raise my wave up. So I do whatever task is at hand with a lot more speed and efficiency or Sometimes, and I think this is always kind of fun, there's ambient waves, believe it or not, that come into your world that can actually lower your wave or flatten your wave. And I, now I've started noticing these ambient waves, and they could be coming from other people, whether you have a naysayer or you have somebody who is just, you know, Debbie Downer. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but like you're like, I'm having a good day, I'm going through it. Someone comes in and they're like, oh, this horrible thing, yeah, you know, you're, or whatever it is, you know, they're in the victim chair and, and, and I'm either trying to pull them up or for whatever reason they pull me down. So I've been really noticing the wave and the wave effect, and it, it really is a, it, the opportunity is to take any thought that makes you feel better in any situation, even whether it's a pleasant one or whether it's, you know, moderately unpleasant or whether it's kind of a uh, not so pleasant, then you have a chance to fix it. And that's just one example. Um, but there's lots and lots of uh, the rules. And I really have found, honestly, with every person I coach, every person that has this opportunity to change their life, these are kind of the basics. And if you can follow these basic mm -hmm. rules, you know, really tie into your emotional radar detector and realize that you're real truth is coming from those feelings that are inside the body. And for any of us who are shut down emotionally, which I think millions of people might feel the same way, where they've been trained not to honor how they feel, which is where I came from, mm -hmm. a really strict you know, Irish Catholic background. You know, the way you feel is wrong <laughs> because you're supposed to be more worried about the other person and how they feel. So I had, mm -hmm. mine was shut down at such a huge level with iron gates. And when I started to really honor and take a look at, wow, that, that crunchiness inside, that does not feel good. I don't know what that person is talking about or what the opportunity is here. I really get in touch with my emotional center, and it has helped, of course. You know, it is the guide. It's, it's from spirit. It's from light, and it's the one that will guide you on the right path. So that took a lot of practice, and so I really encourage anyone and everyone who has not honored their feelings to feel it, get in touch with it, go into it, talk to it, what are you trying to tell me, and really understand when you're getting the beep, 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 to stop. If you need to, take a break, step back, and take a look at what's going on, because I have always found it to be 100% accurate. So, And those are just a couple mm. of examples. Yeah, no, those are fantastic. And we may even, maybe we could walk through one, Diane, if it feels comfortable for you, um, like walk people through a, oh, like what what may happen. Like maybe you're having a good day and then you get into a fender bender or you're, you know, whatever comes. Like how how might you put into practice that exact, you know, when something hits you from out of the blue, what do you stop and do first? Do you get into a meditation? Do you have a list of words that uplift you that you look at? Like what, is, what does that look like for you? Basically, if somebody's like, oh, I want to try that, like what steps would they do to, to implement that? Well, thank you so much for asking me this because I have a current <laughs> life situation. <laughs> Don't we all, right? <laughs> you know, I have a situation that <laughs> recently came up. And for the first time in 20 years, I have a client I did work for that, um, and this is a big business client that's not paying me. And mm -hmm. it's a lot of money. And at first, I had all those feelings, you know, feelings of being a victim, feelings of, did I do something wrong? Or, oh, my God, how could, you know, and then, then the audacity, how could somebody not pay me? And then it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, well, you know so I, I, I let the feelings come up. And a lot of times they sit in the victim area. So... I'll be really honest with you. Sometimes I let myself feel bad for a little bit. I, I say if there's a big comfy victim chair, I'm going to go sit in it and let myself feel terrible with complete permission because you have to let those feelings come. For like, I give myself no more than a day. If I'm going to rant and rave about something, it's a day because I think we have to honor it. I mean, it's there and that doesn't feel good. The second piece that has been so helpful to me 
as I sit, I try to step back and I say, okay, there's a lesson in this. And then I try to figure out, is it my lesson? And if it is my lesson, what am I supposed to be getting out of this situation? Or sometimes, and this is kind of a weird one, but sometimes I think it's somebody else's lesson and I'm just kind of going along with it to teach them something. So sometimes you can look at, is it lesson really for me? If it's repetitive, trust me, there is a lesson in this for you. Get it fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the faster you – now, for me, this is a first-time thing. So I'm like, okay, well, it's not repetitive. And then I tried to say, okay, how can I participate in this with this emotional flat line? It's not really fun, but I have to, do, I have to handle it without going all crazy and haywire. So to come to peace with it, I thought, okay, well, defend myself. What would that mean? stand up for myself, what would that mean, and what actions do I need to take without going emotionally into that fear place, what actions do I need to take to, to change the situation around. So that included, okay, you know, yes, you got to call a lawyer, yes, you have to figure out what that's going to cost, you know, going through the regular steps that it would require to be protected and to be right. I mean, this is, it's, it's an ethical move to defend and protect yourself if you've done full complete good work and you need to be whatever you need to be taken care of and helped and so so Mm -hmm. those are all the pieces I've had to look at what piece is my piece what piece is their piece what can I do to make sure the situation in the long run of we are good people doing good things so I think that we're all going to eventually win and here's the key this is one of the keys that has been really hard for me let go of the attachment to the outcome because, oh my gosh, what if no one ever, ever, ever pays me, <laughs> you know, or mm. am I going to survive? Do you know what I mean? Like you go into that, how dare you to, we're not going to survive. There'll be no food on the table tomorrow. You know, all that dramatic fear-based stuff. And I had to accept that maybe it's not going to work out in my favor. Like maybe there's a bankruptcy mm. or something. You know, I mean, you don't know what that ex- actual outcome is going to be. And then I usually turn to spirit and I'll say, you know, I'm doing my part over here, and I look at it like a matching grant. You guys, <laughs> team, team on the other side, I need you to bring me what's right and do. And, and if it's part of their lesson and I'm participating in it, let them get their lesson, let them work it out, you know, get the support from the other side. So those are some of the key steps that have been very helpful to me. I don't have, I don't have to go stomping and steaming out of my ears or then turn into, which I don't like the whole, like, what did I do wrong? And, and I think we all go to these places. You know, we go to these places of, you know, victim and then villain and then, and then you're going to be, you know. So I, I try to keep myself in this emotional peace area and um, let myself go up and down a little bit, but it really stays pretty cool. And even if I talk about it, you know, one day I may stomp around, but the next day I'm, I'm pretty cool about it. I'm doing what I need to do, and, and, you know, a couple months we'll see how it works out. So that's just an example mm-hmm. because, like, getting hit by a, in, a, in a car accident is not fun. However, mm-hmm. you, when you do get hit, 99.9% of the time, it's to, it's, you're, not, you're not present. You needed to be grounded. You needed to be mm-hmm. brought here back on earth, put those feet back down. What were you doing? How did you participate? What was your piece? What is someone else's piece? And then my daughter, <clears throat> literally she'll hate that I say this, she crashed into the back of my, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but she was backing up out of the garage. And she crashed into the stairwell, which is, or the, you know, the post and the stairs that have been there for the whole time, never moved, you know. <laughs> and I heard the sound, and I thought, that's weird. Of course, the emotional radar detector starts going off. I go outside, and I'm like, did you just crash my car <laughs> into the stairs? And mm-hmm. she's hysterical, you know. And I had to go through this whole thing, like, you know, you go through that, oh, you know, and it's like you got to take it in. You got to call the insurance company, and then they want to know how did it get hit. You know, the whole thing. Anyway, so I just said, you know what? Everyone has a first accident. I'm glad yours was with the stairs. So <laughs> let it go. <laughs> let it go. Walk. You know, it wasn't a person. Thank God. You know, it was, everyone gets an accident that freaks you out. You've had yours. Put it where it belongs and move on. So that's how we deal with it. Keep it all very much in perspective. Mm-hmm. I love that. And one of the things that I'm, I want to tease out of that you're saying is that you're not afraid of that negative emotion and there's nothing bad or wrong about it. Because I think so many times we like don't realize we keep ourselves stuck because we try to think, I don't, I don't want to think negatively. I want to think positively. But 
you know, we are where we are. It's kind of like saying, I want to be in Miami when we're in the middle of New York City. Like, it's okay that we are where we are and that we're feeling the feeling that we're feeling and to give ourselves permission to just, like, have a wham-wham moment. Like, have a day where we're just on the pity party for a while, you know? So it's okay to have that and let that emotion go through because most of the time I've noticed from my own life is that the only reason, like, a resentment or a negativity or Whatever it is, even if beating myself up saying will stay with me, is if I didn't let itself process itself fully. Because once I let it flow through me, it lets go of me. It's it's kind of like uh, it doesn't stay. If I let it have the space that it needs to to process through me like that, you know. So when I let myself have that, what you're saying, like take that day or a few hours or a couple days or whatever to let it process, it lets go of you and your you're more free. You can naturally rise to the place of thinking negative, of thinking positively and looking optimistically towards what's going on, what's going to be coming rather than it doesn't keep you stuck. Right. I, I don't know. if I'm oh, right Exactly. Right no, you're totally yeah. right. And, and here's the thing that got me. Somebody once said to me, nobody cries forever. <laughs> and I thought, yeah. you know, like when you're really, really, really sad and nobody likes to go to that place sometimes where you're just going to cry, yeah. but, it, but, but you stop. Emotions always, always have a cycle, a beginning and an ending. Nobody is literally, I mean, think about it. No one's walking around crying all day long because it's an emotion that will process and will pass. So it was kind of silly. Mm-hmm. Somebody said that, and I'm like, even if you do go there into that sad, you know, you have, we all have a sad spot. You know, maybe there's a sad spot from whatever happened as childhood or even just a recent sad spot. When you go into there, maybe just let that come out. Wow, do you feel, I mean, your eyes are puffy, but you feel better on the other side, (laughs) you know? And the other thing, if I could just touch on, I love what you were saying. I think those of us who are enlightened, who are people who are listening to this type of show, I I was noticing I spiritually bypass everything. Well, I'm spiritual, so I shouldn't have a reaction to that. Or, you know, sometimes things don't, weren't right, or they didn't feel right, or you did get, you know, someone's taking advantage of you, or something didn't go, and I was trying to always like, well, I'm a spiritual person, therefore I'm not going to have that experience, and I'm Mm -hmm. catching myself now, saying the spiritual bypass actually is not fully integrated or authentic, because we've just gone, oh, we're spiritual people, uh, that's cool, and actually it hurt, whatever it was, that hurt. And I think I've been letting myself go back down into being the emotional person for a while and just either expressing it completely and and feeling it and then, like you said, just allowing yourself to process it. Yeah. It's just absolutely beautiful how you've articulated it and how you you practice that in your real life. You know, it's just – it's authentic. It's real. It's where it is. And there's no – like self-judgment of, oh, I should be past this. I'm spiritual now. I shouldn't have these crying fits. Or I shouldn't resent people. Or I shouldn't feel jealous. It's like, you know, you're, we're just human beings. We feel what we feel when we feel it. And there's nothing bad or wrong about that. And it will let go of us if we let it flow through. So I, I, I think I just beautifully articulated, Diane, like really fantastic. And we have a few minutes left before I um, lead us into the meditation. And I know one of the um, little terms that you have is one of pragmatic metaphysics. And that's one of the things I wanted to touch on and have you flesh out for us a little bit. Well, um, I would love to because that is um, my own branch of science because <laughs> I figured, <laughs> why not, right? Um, and and I, <laughs> I've noticed that the thing that has been the most helpful for me is to look at, I'm going to call it like logical mysticism. It's a little bit of mm-hmm. East and a little bit of West. And I'm half hippie, half yuppie. So when you put the um, the business aspect, which is, you know, of course, we a lot of us have these giant brains, this giant mental side, um, which is very helpful. And then there's some other people who are saying, well, we have to be all spiritual and woo-woo and, and all the, you know, just esoteric and, and, and into that side. And what I try to do is I put them together in any situation. So it allows me to look at things with not only the the beautiful side of spirituality and enlightenment, but I like to add the measurement side into it. So everything that I've been working on, and I do have another book that I'm I'm putting together that has this combination of rules and, and like a formula that allows manifestation to come so easily when you add 
all of the, the, the beauty and the soft side with all of the actual functional, and I'm going to say hard side, the, the practical side. I mean, we are spirits that have embodied here on earth, and we have allowed ourselves to measure time and measure space and measure distance and measure height. And so what I've been able to kind of put together is this combination where if one thing works, you'll find that typically there's a really cool formula behind it that you don't even know is a formula. So that's kind of like how I like to explain pragmatic metaphysics. Um, You know, you could say you will probably notice, just notice in your own life, everything that works well consistently, there's a little formula going on behind it. And if you stay on the formula, you get really good results typically. And when we're off formula, and this is a really great way to talk to your families, when you're off formula, you'll notice that there's usually tension, can be bickering, people start to get antsy. And so we're, we always talk in our, in our own household about, okay, well, if my son's getting off, I'll say, okay, what did I do to kind of like shake him up? And I'm like, oh, I didn't tell him in advance that there's a change. He loves to know about changes before they happen. You know, but I'm mm-hmm. so flowing, I'm not always good at that. <laughs> so I'll yeah. notice like he gets off when I break his formula. So that gives, us a, that gives us a chance to just kind of like be really aware of what we're going through, how we affect other people, and how those little formulas kind of keep peace. And so that's, mm-hmm. that's just kind of a little example of pragmatic metaphysics. I love it. Awesome. And I just I love that term, too. It's a very refreshing way to look at stuff and to connect it, that it's not so esoteric, that, but it's actually grounded and practical in the real world, which is my experience, too. Um, really great, Diane. So before I lead us into the meditation, is there anything that we overlooked or didn't touch on that you have a burning desire to share or any kind of last words or thoughts that you'd like to um, leave everybody with? Well, one of, the, one of the things I always like to say is that your middle years can absolutely be the best time of your life as they have been for me. It is never too late to reboot your life. And the book that we have available is called The Real Brass Ring, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, also through my website, which is liveyoureverything.com, which I have created to be a sanctuary, and it's still in development and still new and, and growing. But I'd like to make it a sanctuary for midlife transformation. Mm. And thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> I know. It is for me, too. It's really great. And you've been amazing. I, I think your energy is just absolutely fantastic and refreshing and I love your spin on stuff and I love how focused and um, inspired your life has unfolded to be and I'm just so glad that you're here in the world sharing your light and so grateful that you're sharing it with my listeners and with me so thank you so so much oh thank you so much for having me this has been this has been just delightful Oh, I'm so glad. Awesome, awesome. And so everybody, if you're looking for Diane and her book, you can check out her website, her little sanctuary that she's creating online, liveyoureverything.com. And if you're looking for me, you can check out madlychasingpeace.com. Take care, everyone, and we'll catch you next week. Bye-bye for now.